Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session with Brian and Janice. We want to apologize for the interruptions that we had last night due to internet service, but we're back tonight to, to start from where we left off last night. Tonight, we're going to start by talking about the black man's struggle to survive. And we want to let you know that we are very much aware We are very much aware. Brian, stop. We are very much aware of uh, what our what's being our black men are being faced with today in reference to uh, struggles as far as the economy, uh, government, uh, racism, uh, which impacts all African Americans, but especially our black men. So, without further ado, I'm going to let Brian begin to enlighten you on this episode due to the fact that he is a black male and who better to tell another black man about the struggles than a, another black man. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Again, we do apologize for uh, uh, the troubles that we had on yesterday, as Janice has said, uh, but we're going to be discussing. We're just going to be picking up and, and having our discussion as it relates to the black man's struggle uh, to survive in uh, this country in the United States. On part one and part two, we talked briefly about uh, some of the dynamics that shape uh, the environment that black men exist in today uh, by way of slavery and by way of the past that uh, really has uh, made an impact on how black men function today, not only how we function, but also how we react to certain situations. Uh, we can give many examples, uh, as we have done, uh, but black men are facing a dilemma, I think, in just my personal opinion, that is grave uh, as it relates to our survival and our existence uh, in this country. And when I say existence, I'm not just talking about merely uh, staying on this planet, but I'm talking about being relevant in society. And that is a big difference. Um, when we look at history, history uh, bears out the fact that black men were labeled as insufficient. Black men were labeled as, uh, well, really none would be none. Right. To Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To society. You're exactly right. So there were a lot of different categories that were placed on black men by way of historical teachings and propaganda so that black men would be viewed a certain way in society. Unfortunately, those labels, uh, those uh, particular, I, I like to say classifications and the caste system that was created due to a social construct was uh, powerful enough to where it has followed us almost four generations. Yes. So when we deal with black men, we're dealing with black men from that aspect. We're looking at uh, how our history has shaped our present and how our history will continue to shape our future, our future mm -hmm. as well. So those are some things that we, we want to deal with uh, tonight just to kind of give you a brief recap of what we've covered. We talked about historically, uh, we got to when we deal with black men and the actual uh, situations that we face today and how we react as black men today, how we uh, internalize some of the things that go on with us. We have to look back at some of the men that shaped the ideology of uh, black people in general, but specifically black men. Uh, so you have to talk about uh, some of the men like the uh, John Cottons of the world, yes. the Richard Matters of the world, the Cotton Matters of the world. Uh, those men were very, very instrumental in shaping how uh, the United States viewed black people in general. Not only, like I said, black people, but black men in specific. Black men were considered to be brutes. Black men were labeled as uh they're again lazy like you said yes 
Uh, we were labeled as non-productive in society. So there were a lot of things that factored into the way that society views us today is based off of the account of history and some of the so-called great intellectuals out of Europe. Uh, when we talk about the European nations, we're talking about out of Britain, out of England, uh, some of the missionaries that actually uh, shaped the thinking of how black people were were viewed and why black people were viewed a certain way and the stigma attached to the mother country as the dark continent yes. and uh, as the continent that was a continent that produced uh, non-intellectuals, uh, people that were basically animalistic in nature and they that were also uh, as far as physicality uh, had physical abilities, but the physical abilities did not complement their mental, the their intellectual, mindset, the intellectual abilities. Right, yes. abilities. So when we look at all of that, uh, guys, we, we can then see the dynamic of the black man's struggle. Yes. So you, there's no way that we can really see the dynamic of the black man's struggle without knowing the past of the black man and what has shaped the black man and what environment the black man was bred in. Uh, so the, the black man was bred in a hostile environment, yes. abusive. Uh, the very abusive mm -hmm. environment. That's correct. The black man has always been uh, targeted in this society, has always been um, one that was, I guess you would say. And, Looked and down upon. Back, yeah, but let me back up and, and say this, that the black man has always been stereotyped definitely in this society and viewed in light of being less than yes as it relates to any other species on this planet so when we look at those dynamics shaping the black men mm -hmm. black man uh, then we can get a good picture of why the black man reacts to the way uh reacts to uh, some things the way he reacts. Why the black man actually uh, look at black women a certain way? Why the black man, man approach religion a certain way? Mm -hmm. Approach education a certain way? When we understand all of the dynamics in history that have shaped us, then we can understand why black men today in this social construct that has been systematically created for black men to fail in and for black men to continue to be marginalized in and for black men to continue to be dehumanized in why we function the way we function okay. and that is on all parameters is not just on uh you know one particular thing, but it's in all areas of our life, why we function the way we function, why we react to uh, things the way we do, why we think like we think, mm -hmm. why we are against one another. Okay. All of those things uh, can be answered when we look at the history of what entails the shaping and the creation of what we now know as this modern black man okay, okay. Uh, so we want to I, I want to just give you some um, stats. some some stats real quick just to help you uh, understand what we are actually dealing, dealing with. with today um, as the black man continues to try to fight and survive in, in this in this United States yes. okay. Uh, first, let's start off with education because education always seems to be the A key component. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's the elephant in the room, yes. literally. Yes. OK, yes. Uh, that is always going to be brought up. And, and one thing that uh, the European always says is that if the black man would just get more education or would educate himself, yes. then he, he can do be better. There. He can progress right. in society. He could be just like we are. Mm -hmm. Well, those facts just aren't true. No, they're not. Uh, when the black man was denied the right to read, he was denied the right 
to learn how to write. He was denied the right to attend certain educational institutions. Yes. He had to work in the field. Yes. So all of those things as it relates to the dynamic of uh, our ancestors and what they experienced in slavery, being enslaved, factors into from a standpoint of hereditary, okay, mm -hmm. generational pass downs, now affecting the black man and his existence today. So we'll start off with some stats yes, from blackdemographics.com. Yes. I want to give people that website reference. so you can actually reference this and do the research yourself. Uh, you can also go to NAACP. Mm -hmm. You can also go to the Washington Post, which has very, very in-depth uh, details yes. uh, and stats, yes, on uh, some of the things that we're talking about now. But anyway, uh, the black man, as far as education, the black man makes up 21 million. There are 21 million black men in today's population. Okay. Out of that 21 million black men that exist in today's population, 15% or less of black men have a high school diploma or a GD equivalent. Mm -hmm. Okay. 15% or less has a high school diploma or GED equivalent. 35% of black men graduate from high school. Out of 21 million black men, 35% graduate from high school. Out of that 35%, I want everybody to understand this 15% do not graduate from high school or have less than a high school education, education okay. and less than a GED equivalent diploma. It's startling. 23% of black men go to college and do not finish college. They just have some college. 7% graduate with an associate degree, 12% graduate with a BS degree, and 7% have a graduate degree or a professional degree. Okay? Okay. Very, very telling because, like I said, when you go back to the shaping the social construct and the social engineering and the systematic engineering of the black male, we see that part of making the black male dysfunctional in society was keeping him ignorant. Okay. So the whole makeup of the labor class depended on the black man being non-educated. So historically, there were efforts made, just like the efforts made to educate, there were just as many efforts made to not to make sure that they the did black not. Men, that's right, that they did not get an education. And that is reflected in the numbers today mm -hmm. as we see black men, quote unquote, less concerned now about getting an education. Black men are, are in this particular time are less concerned about getting an education than they are just about trying to survive in this society and avoid being killed by the police, avoid being falsely accused by a justice system, okay. avoid being taken advantage of by quote unquote, and we're gonna talk about this, not a slight to our black women, but feel like they've been taken advantage of, of a black woman, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So those different dynamics play into what we are, are discussing as it relates to that. All right, so now that's the education piece that we're looking at. Let's go to from the education piece to the employment piece. Okay, the earnings and employment of the black male from the age of 16 to 64, which is the age of employment that is filed through the federal government, okay? 69% of black men 
are in the labor force. 69%. Not 69% are in the labor. Now, I'm going to explain to you what that means. Okay. Okay. So don't, don't, don't think that that, oh, that's a great number. No, it's not a good number. We will talk about that. Okay. 89% of the labor force, black men, 89% of that labor force are employed. Okay. You, you following me? So 69% are in the labor force. And out of that, in, so 69% are in the labor force, and 89% of the labor force are actually employed. <laughs> okay, so now we, we, we're going to get to, all right, 21% of black men are living below the poverty level because their earnings are not sufficient enough to meet standard needs. And when I say standard needs, we're talking about uh, having a home over your head, being able to feed yourself, being able to clothe yourself, and having dependable transportation to go to work. 21% of black men are below the poverty line. Okay. All right. So now let's go back to the 69% that are in the labor force. Okay. In the labor force simply means that they work at random. They either work through unemployment agencies or labor agencies. Like temp agencies? Temp agencies, exactly. Okay. 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 So that means that they can work a week and be off two months. Wow. Or that they can work two months or three months. And be off a month or two. And, and be off a month. Also, what that means when we talk about working in the labor force, it means that they are not due any benefits. When they work in the labor force, they do not qualify for insurance. They do not qualify for retirement. They do not qualify for vacations. They do not qualify for PTO paid time off. They do not qualify for F, uh, FMLA, FMLA mm -hmm. family Family and Medical, medical Leave, leave Act, Act that's, they don't yeah. qualify. So when we talk about 69% are in the labor force but are unemployed. Wow. That means that they are working through agencies that offer them no benefits of employment at all. So we, you know, that is a drastic number. Wow. Okay. So... We have to discuss that. Why is that? You know, uh, when when black men have been relegated to a substandard labor class, then, quote unquote, it is the concept of the plantation. OK, where we work them on these jobs, labor, labor force jobs, because labor force agencies normally are agencies for labor force jobs. Yes. Okay. That's why they're called labor force agencies. That's why they're called temp agencies because they are basically labor force type jobs that, uh, you know, a dime a dozen. You have your managers on these jobs and then you bring in a labor force to do the hard work. Okay. 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 The same concept of the overseer and the plantation. You have your field slaves, which is your labor force, okay, as it relates to picking the cotton, bringing viability to your asset, which is cotton, mm -hmm. okay. You pay them literally nothing, and you have your overseer or your management class making sure that the work gets done and that everybody pick their fair share, mm -hmm. okay, to make a profit. It's the same concept, all right? So 89% of the labor force who are employed are employed below 21% or below the poverty line, okay? So 89% of the labor force are employed. So what does that mean? That means 20% more than the 69% that 
out of that 69%, 20% tacked on to that normally will, will end up with full-time jobs from those temp agencies. <laughs> okay. okay, I got it. You, you follow what I'm yeah. saying? So that's, what, that's how we get the 89% okay. of those that are employed through the labor floors. Okay. Okay. 69% work, 20% of those people go on to full-time employment through the agency. Okay. okay. But 21% still live below poverty when they are fully employed. Okay, let me give you some some facts on that. This is in 2017, 2018. Full time earnings working year round. Okay, full time job of a black male was thirty five to forty thousand dollars a year. Okay. That's full time, full time working year round earnings part time was 22% of black males were earning part-time. Out of that, the black males earning full-time wages, which was 35 to 40, that was about 37%. Okay, so 37% of black males work full-time, meaning year-round and have a job that offers them benefits, 401k, pension, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 22% work part-time and have no benefits at all. Okay, none. And out of that 22%, they earn less than $21,000 a year. Okay, now <clears throat> let's talk about no earnings. 41% of the black male population from the ages of 16 to 64, 41% have no annual earnings wow. right now. So when you look at that and you factor in the black man having to survive what we're talking about, a struggle to survive, having a family to support, having children to feed, having uh, uh, an apartment, a place of living to try to provide for his family. Transportation. Just the basic needs, like I said, the standard needs of life, it makes it virtually impossible for him not to get involved in some type of activity that may be criminal to support his family. <laughs> you understand? Got it. Yes. Okay. So I tell people there's no difference between a drug dealer and a CEO of a company. Of a company. The only difference is, is that the drug dealer is targeted and don't have money like the CEO with the big time lawyers just in case they get caught. Okay? So there, there's no there's really no difference. Okay. CEO has the legal advisors and attorneys. To cover their tracks, the drug dealer doesn't. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, the drug dealer is targeted by the local police officers. Yes. And and the local DEAs and narcotic agencies, yes. NEA. But the CEO, CEO targeted. is targeted by the FBI and the CIA. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? There's no difference at all. One has the legal team and the attorneys to cover his tracks. That's that's the only difference. Okay. So what I tell people is criminal activity, even when you look in history, when you look at the Al Capones, and you, you when you go back and you look at these uh gangs yes. that ran alcohol when <laughs> prior to alcohol being legalized is no different from the marijuana dealer. That's exactly right. That's in the neighborhood now that 13 states have now legalized. Okay. Okay. To try to put the marijuana dealer out of business. The reason that drugs are legalized is because the state, the county, and the feds 
want in on some of the capital. That's why they're not legalized. That's why they are legalized. Oh, really? Because they want a piece of the pie. Hmm. Okay. So if if that was why they were not legalized, then alcohol would still be illegal. The reason that alcohol was legalized is so that the state could make money. That's exactly right. ABC okay. board. That's right. Okay. And under the black market. Those gangs, what we call the Italian mobs, and the you, you understand yeah. what I'm saying? They were making big money running black market alcohol. Mm. The state and the feds realized if we don't stop this, you know, we need to get in on the cut. <laughs> and they saw the power that these men had, knowing that they were doing illegal drugs. So they couldn't fully infiltrate them because of the family structure okay. that was there. So the best thing to do was to legalize it and take away from their portion of the pie and charge them taxes to now and charge them for business licenses and charge them for liquor licenses in order to, if not put them out of business, at least make them accountable to the system now okay, okay. so that's a short on that I you know you. that that yes. we could go there's some great books out there that i can actually uh reference. we'll reference yes. and we'll we can look at it when we we'll deal with that on another session okay. but so the black male 41 percent of black men have no earnings annually mm. they are unemployed so Part of that is, uh, you know, part of that is is the reason why we see so much crime in our neighborhoods. OK, so now let me, let me give you another quick fact. Three percent of black men make less than ten thousand dollars a year. Twelve percent of black men make less than twenty thousand dollars a year. 20% of black men make less than $30,000 a year. 32% oh. of black men make less than $50,000 a year. And 20% make less than $75,000 a year. Think about that. So the, the medium income for black men, 32% make between Thirty-five and forty-nine thousand dollars a year. Twenty percent make between forty-nine thousand or fifty thousand dollars a year and seventy-five thousand okay. dollars a year. Less than thirteen percent makes seventy-five thousand dollars or more a year. Only one percent owns businesses that they can technically call their own that's not a franchise less than one percent okay so the black man's struggle in this country is very real so when we talk about uh core values and black men uh having to regain self-identity we talk about self-empowerment, self-love, all of those things. It's very difficult for a black man to look within himself yes. and to see hope when the system is stacked against him. When the system has been designed so that he fails on every level. Okay. Now that's the unemployment uh stats sweetie and we could go on we could go on and on and give some more stats let me just in reference to that unemployment stat 41 percent of black men that are working work what we consider white collar jobs those are management jobs mm -hmm. Banking. computer jobs mm -hmm. yeah legal jobs okay. things of that nature admin type jobs those are considered white collar jobs 36 percent of black men work blue collar jobs 
which would be considered construction, mm -hmm. uh, maintenance and factory, factory work, mm -hmm. production work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have 36 in that category. 23% of black men work what we call service occupations. Service occupations would be police officer, fireman, okay. dietary specialist, okay, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, social worker, okay. So now you, you think about those jobs and then you have over 40%, which equals to 41% of the white collar, over 40% between the ages of 16 and 25 years of age works what we call labor uh, jobs, Walmart, okay? okay. Um, Your restaurant. Grocery stores, Winn-Dixie, Publix, okay. okay? Yes, restaurants, they work labor force jobs. Those are considered labor force jobs because they are jobs that are normally part-time with no benefits. So from 16 to 25, over 40 percent of black men are working and not accumulating anything that will help them as they get older, not accumulating any monies for a 401k or a pension, not accumulating any real type of work history because those jobs, you can go from McDonald's, Walmarts, Taco Bell, you, you understand what I'm saying, the grocery store, at random. And a resume doesn't mean as much in those type of jobs. Basically, they just want an application to be filled out. They application to be filled out. They want a body to fill the space, so okay. to speak. So when we look at those things, black men, like I said, we're facing paramount conditions yes. due to the system putting us at the bottom. Now, let me give you some more. This is going to really get you. The labor jobs in construction mm -hmm. that are considered blue collar jobs, the maintenance jobs, the production jobs are now being filled by other ethnic groups, Asians, Hispanics, Hispanics. Yes. Mexicans, Latinos falling into that Hispanic category. Yes. The black man is now being pushed out of the blue collar workforce and is being made to have to resort to nothing but the labor force, meaning working the jobs that have no benefits and that are not quote unquote jobs unless you have education and get into the management level of those jobs are going to provide for any assistance if something happens long term to that black man okay no accidental death insurance no life insurance attached to it no medical insurance attached to it he's working literally for free mm -hmm. So when we boil down the stats, when we analyze what he made, $13, $14 an hour, which most of those jobs, that's what they're starting at, okay? Only working 30 to 32 hours a week so that he's not considered full-time and the company doesn't have to pay benefits. The black man, now if he has a medical emergency to come up, has to come out of his pocket Yes. And those $13 an hour that he made in that one pay period is gone. He had worked for free, literally. So those are the type of things that we're talking about. Those are the type of things that we have to discuss and that are very real when it comes to uh, the, the mentality and how black men have been systematically designed and engineered and shaped mm -hmm. uh, concerning what we face on a daily basis. Okay. Yeah. Give you some more facts. In Birmingham, Alabama, today, for every 100 women, there are only 80 black men. In Mobile, Alabama, the ratio 
is 76 black men to 100 women. In Montgomery, Alabama, it is even less than that. It's about 70% or 70 black men to every 100 black women. Think about that. This is what's going to get you. When we look at the difference there, 10 to 15 percent are in prison. Wow. OK, so if you throw that 10 percent back in there, that would at least put us at 90 to 100. <laughs> OK, you throw the 15 percent and put us at 95, basically. Okay, in the Birmingham area, take a little bit more than that. So you look at Montgomery, which is 70 percent and below, you have almost 25 to 30 percent of the black male population is in prison. Or either in jail. Absent from the black woman. And not for major crimes, we're talking about for petty crimes, we're talking about marijuana. Theft of property, you know, these these are, are, are petty crimes, nothing that they should really literally be doing any time for. Because when you look at their counterparts with the same crimes, they are first time offenders. They get put on probation. Yes. Second time offenders, they yes. get a fine yes. and probation increase. They do not go to jail unless it is an offense that's committed three or more times. Wow. The black man, it is the first time. Mm -hmm. Thank Bill Clinton for the three strikes and you're out. That majority, that law affected 65 to 70 percent of black men that were doing petty drug crimes. And when I say petty drug crimes, I'm talking about get caught with marijuana or have marijuana be in the in his possession when he stopped not smoking it, not doing it. They just have a bag of marijuana in the car, something that they over 65 percent of black men. Before after that law were charged with misdemeanor crimes as it relates to drug possessions. Sad. Okay. Right now, 2018, there were 573,900 black men in prison. 573,900 black men, that was as of 2017-2018, were in prison. Now, that prison count does not factor in petty crimes and black men that are in jail. Wow. <laughs> <Oof>. Okay. <laughs> so what we're showing is some of the dynamics that we face as black men, family. Uh, we need to understand why the some of the rage exists. We need to understand why some of the 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 hopelessness exists now that we're seeing in black men. We need to understand why the crime level level is the way it is in black communities. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a lot of times black on black crime is a way to commit suicide. And, and, and I've said this. Yes based on you not having enough guts to do it to yourself, so you do it to someone else. In, in, in the black man's eyes, to take my brother out who have wronged me, I'm helping him. Some of, how, how some of the gangs think, you understand what I'm saying? In the mentality that's being shaped. See, it's not, it's, it's not just warring over territory and warring over uh, my clientele versus your clientele. Some of this goes much deeper than that when you look at the psychology of what the black man is having to deal with. It's not just about turf war or my woman versus your woman or my drug clients versus your drug clientele. It's about brother, I know you tired of being here. Let me take you on out of here. And then the the mentality there is is I don't have long to live anyway. 
Oh, I have nothing to live for. Oh, I have nothing to live for. However we want to phrase it. That is the psychology that they deal with based on these systems that have been set up to purposely push them into the bottom echelon of not only society, but the human species. And we got to understand that this was a social construct that was created over 400 years. It was created when this nation was formed. When you have founders of this country, Thomas Jefferson, that everybody talks about, that does not value did not and did not value you right thank you for correcting me did not value the life of the black man and looked at the black man as a substandard species when you have leading missionaries like a cotton matter that states that the black man was just a was just slightly above intellectually slightly above the ape when, and, and, and see, these are, are men that actually shaped this country. Cotton Matter was considered to be one of Europe's greatest intellectuals. Wow. And wrote the book on Negro civilization in America and how the Negro was viewed by white people, not only upper class, but what we consider the planter class, and then the peasant class, all looked at black men the same way. Looked at them as brutes, non-functional in society. And that is why Thomas Jefferson, to the day he died, talked about, he, he pushed the ideology, which Abraham Lincoln takes up yes. after Thomas Jefferson, Okay, but he pushed, he was the first to push the ideology based off of some of the intellectuals, including Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. And it takes me some time to tell y'all about this history, but it's phenomenal. He picks up the ideology that we need to send these people back to Africa or we need to uh, isolate them from the rest of the nation because they're non productive, they're lazy, they're no more than. Uh, animals. Ad, animals, that's right. Mm -hmm. They are, and that's where the whole concept of the three fifths of a human mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. into the Constitution. Exactly, Brian. So we have to understand who wrote the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. who penned it was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson. Yes. Okay, so when those being met on July the 2nd, 1776, to debate over the, over the Declaration, of independence, okay? And then they come back two days later, July the 4th, mm. 1776. After the debate, part of that debate was when they wrote, when Thomas Jefferson penned all men are equal, he did not factor in the black man. So in the Declaration of Independence, when it talks about all men being equal, is only talking about men of the Americas being equal to men of Europe because the European hierarchy had began to look down on the white Americans and call them buffoons and, and say that they were no more than criminals. So the whole revolution, which starts with the intellectuals, the Jeffersons, the Ben Franklins, who was going back and forth to Europe and the Americas, okay, debating yes. on certain topics and issues. One was slavery. Thomas Jefferson, who is the pinner, states that in order for us to not only set ourselves on the same plateau as our European brothers, okay. We need to declare our independence. This is how the whole Declaration of Independence comes into play. And when we declare our independence, we declare our independence as men that are of, of statue and that are, that are of 
uh, intellectual tenacity, we declare ourselves equal to them. And we let them know that we are no less than you are. We have property who are our slaves. Okay, We are just as wealthy as the king sitting in the place taxing us. And we refuse from this point on to deal with that anymore. So the whole debate that those two days and two nights, history records that they went all day, all night from July the 2nd, July the 3rd. And when they final had the final draft, July the 4th, mm-hmm. okay, that we all get dewy eyed and celebrate. Black folks still celebrating the 4th of July and have no <laughs> idea that the 4th of July declared all white men equal to white men and black men were not in the equation. The black race was not in the equation. So when I hear Negro people talking about quoting the Declaration of Independence, it shows me that they do not have not studied their history to understand That when that Declaration of Independence talks about all men being created equal, it does not. It does not include us, and and that is factual. Okay, so what the black man has to deal with is, like I said, is is on a level of um, you know that most people and most other uh, races. Races. Have never dealt with and never will deal with. I'm gonna give these last few facts. We didn't talk about anything as relates to the core values. <laughs> well, maybe we'll finish that up next yes. week. Let's talk about black men that are married. Okay. So we're gonna hit the divorce rate now. Divorce rate. That's exactly right. Okay. The divorce rate of black men is 10% that are divorced or widowed. Uh, black men that are currently married is 33%. Okay. And then black men that have never been married is 52%. Wow. Okay. 9% of black men are married to white women. Okay. 9% of black men are married to white women. 3% are married to Asian or Hispanic women someone of let me just say someone of another ethnicity other than caucasian and 85 percent of black men are married to black women so it still shows that there there are some core values there you know like i said we'll we'll really get into how to bring that out and rehabilitating the black man uh, so that that self-determination, that self-love, that self-knowledge, all of that returns to him. Um, and, and, and he began to value again his black woman and to understand how to overcome this game that we've been locked in. Okay. Uh, our ancestor, Dick Gregory, says that from day one, this has been a game that the black man is locked in this system. And Dr. Clark Anderson says that we are in a real life monopoly game. Yes. It's about who understands the game and who plays the game the best. best. Those are the ones that are going to win at the game. So to leave off, we'll we'll conclude with this. Like I said, when you factor in the 33 percent that are married. okay, And you factor in 25 percent of the population of black men that are in prison, 573,900, that pretty much makes up 28, 29% of the 52% that are not married or have never been married. The reason that they've never been married is because they didn't get a chance to, they went to jail or they were locked up and put in prison. So we'll end on that note. We're, we're a little bit over, but uh, we'll come back next week and we'll deal with the spiritual component okay. on how to, the, like I said, the rehabilitation of the black male and helping that black 
man to rediscover self-knowledge, self-love, self-determination, some of those uh, beautiful things, the Kuji Chagalia, okay, of Kwanzaa, the self-determination, all of those things. So we'll we'll talk about those things and and, uh, we'll discuss the book, Black Men to Black Men. Yes. And we'll deal with some pointers out of that book and and uh, give some good references for next week, especially those women that have young black men, uh, those women that are married to a black man. All of these things women need to understand as well so that they can understand what their man are dealing with. Yes. You know, socially, daily basis. every daily, day, daily basis. every day. Yes. And let me tell you something, the social environment that is put in place, whether we want to accept it or not, subconsciously, it's there. it affects us Yes, every day as a black male. There's nowhere that that black man can go to where he is not affected subconsciously by the system that's been put in place to marginalize and dehumanize him. And those are just the facts. Okay, so we'll end. I'll let you. (laughs) Thank you guys for joining us. Um, There's a lot more coming down the pipe, and uh, we appreciate all those that were able to get online and join us tonight. Hopefully that uh, you'll share this and spread the word. uh, Men and Women of Destiny, that is what our organization is called, Men and Women of Destiny. We are on YouTube under Men and Women of Destiny. You can subscribe free. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, you can always go back and look at any of our programs. Uh, we have just we've been doing this since May, and we so very much appreciate each and every one of you all have been uh, supporting us and getting all this good information and knowledge. And anything you have questions about, you can always uh, send a comment or you can inbox me. We you check these the daily. Um, <laughs> we check these daily. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, we check these daily, so please don't be afraid to reach out, ask questions. We love to share. Uh, also, like I said, go on our YouTube channel, Men and Women of Destiny. So with that being said, thank you for joining us tonight, and we appreciate you guys, and we love you. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>